Okay, thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jan. And I'm Jan Jay. Uh, and we will tell you the story of implementing Airflow at our organization. Um, with that, we're very excited to be taking our first steps in the Airflow community. Uh, given that we're relatively new users of Airflow, having been using it productively for just over a year and a half, um, we hope our session will prove useful as a use case of how Airflow can be rolled out at an organization with specifics similar to ours, especially given that the realities of IT environments at very large banks such as ours is often that uh, they uh, are heavily regulated and it is sometimes difficult to implement changes in such environments. As you can see in the slide, uh, our Warsaw team in Poland is responsible for the punctuality and quality of data deliveries sent from Murex, uh, which is an, a major investment banking application uh, across the Unicredit banking group. These data feeds are based on ETL batch processes, which are scheduled to run daily and produce data files, which are then distributed across the Unicredit group uh, to a number of applications and systems for addressing a number of uh, reporting needs. Uh, as you see in the slide, we have over 8,000 batch tasks running daily. Together, they process over 2.5 billion data points. Ah, wrong direction. And in our session, we will start with the legacy issues, so simply uh, reasons why we're moving from the mainframe schedulers to Airflow. Then how we got here, we will present the timelines and scope of migrations. After that, the challenges, so what difficulties we met during our migrations. Then the target solution, so how our uh, final version looks like, and finally what we gained, so simply summary of this session. So in discussing the legacy issues of our environment, uh, we will be focusing on the mainframe scheduler, which was the backbone of our original scheduling setup. Um, and uh, this so scheduler had a number of disadvantages, which ultimately uh, were one of the main drivers of our uh, search for a better solution and uh, they, uh, we will go deeper into these disadvantages to better illustrate the context of our journey to Airflow. First off, uh, there was a very difficult maintenance process with a manual deployment procedure involving a number of teams, whereas we as the application team uh, wanted to make, a, whenever we wanted to make a change in the scheduling, we would have to direct our request as a ticket to a number of other teams who are then responsible for implementing this change. Anybody working in a very large organization could, I think this could ring a bell. Um, and this was generally a very lengthy deployment process, which was a bottleneck. And uh, the human, I would say, elements involved could lead to errors, miscommunications. We actually had cases like the one in the slide where an email was, was, was misread, and uh, we had a task remove instead of move. Furthermore, we had a limited number of environments and instances on which we could test uh, changes in the scheduling uh, and no easy way of getting more. And we also had one run scheduled per day, which meant that if we had a failed test for any reason, we would have to wait a full calendar day before being able to repeat the test. Um, and this generally uh, limited our testing capacity. And these factors were, like I said, bottlenecks in any deployment process that we undertook. And uh, due to this, we had a very long time to market, at least one day for a very simple change and much more for complex changes. Finally, we had a rigid scheduling model. By that, I mean that all of our tasks were scheduled explicitly after each other with de uh, dependencies defined directly. Uh, there was no flexibility in that. And uh, given that we had over thousands of tasks, if we had threads of tasks running, uh, so to speak, in, in parallel by chance, uh, this would cause increased resource usage. And we had no easy way of uh, managing this situation. We had no easy way of spreading those tasks out any change that the dependencies would have to go through the manual change process described in the first one. So in the end, our capacity and capability of uh, managing our resource usage was limited. And the rigid scheduling model is perhaps uh, better illustrated by this slide, where we have a visualization, or an attempt to visualize our scheduling network uh, as it was originally, and only a small fragment of it is visible because by the number of connections, you can guess that overall it was impossible to visualize in one uh, screenshot, in one screen. So given that we had no dependency visualization and we had thousands of tasks with many to many relationships, the resulting network of dependencies was massive. And uh, this was another bottleneck because any analyst who wanted to add a new task to be scheduled or 
uh, let's say, add a number of tasks to this network, but have to first understand the existing scheduling in order to build, being able to build on, uh, on, on that. So, uh, like I said, it was, uh, we had a number of bottlenecks in the process, and we ended up moving to Airflow, and this slide will be a timeline of how we got here. Uh, first off, we started in, I mean, the journey started in May 2020 with the deployment of a scheduler script that we created in-house in Python. Um, this was not Airflow, this was something we had created ourselves. Uh, and generally this created, I mean, this uh, generated a massive upgrade in terms of all the uh, issues that we had originally with the mainframe scheduler in our environment locally. Uh, finally, the configuration was stored as code that was owned by our own team, so we could change it, scale it, do, it, do what we liked with it. Uh, we had no bottlenecks, I mean, most of the major issues were resolved. And we wanted to continue down this path because I, as you see in the slide, we only moved 40% of our tasks to this in-house solution. Um, but then we realized that in order to do so uh, in a way that would address all the local requirements of our environment, we would have to perform a number of upgrades to the custom solution. For example, we would have to uh, transform it into a service-based product. Um, and we realized that the effort to do that would was, uh, let's say, greater than our capacity to develop uh, such upgrades at the time. So we uh, decided instead to seek out an open source project that could potentially meet all, uh, meet our needs. And after some digging, we found Airflow, which uh, proved to meet all of our uh, needs and expectations quite elegantly, and also delivered much more. So after the proof of concept was delivered in October 21, uh, we launched initiatives to implement Airflow, meaning to move our scheduled tasks into Airflow away from the original uh, solution. The first deployment in production was in May 22, whereas the, um, let's say, biggest initiatives to move our tasks into Airflow finalized in October 22 and April 23. As you can see, we're still yet to achieve 100% coverage. Um, we plan to get there next year, but the journey does not stop there because, uh, like I hinted at the beginning of the, of the session, uh, our system is only one of many, and uh, our next goal is to uh, propagate airflow in our organization in order to enable uh, and encourage our surrounding systems and applications to also move into airflow as well. Uh, so the challenges, so uh, the difficulties we met during our migrations. Um, first of all, we need to deeply understand how the original process worked. Uh, some of the dependencies were fake to balance environmental resources. Others need to remain because the process required them. And uh, taking into, into account the scope, around 8,000 tasks, this requires several months of analytical work. Um, another challenge was to fit Airflow to uh, use current processes such as incident management resulting from the company policy. Um, this process should be understood as a way to properly address production failures with proper priority. And the assumption is quite simply, if a single task fails, then an incident must be created by an external system. Um, a significant challenge was the dependency of the external systems. And previously, these were simply dependencies between two scheduling jobs of two other applications. For example, if gathering data from application A will finish, then trigger job in application B. And uh, we had to fit into this concept that only one application scheduling was migrated. <coughs> and these two last uh, points are linked together. Uh, from the beginning, we knew that our DAGs we will create will form some, some chain, some kind of a chain. And we had to somehow work out how to do this when we started work with, uh, uh, in, uh, in Airflow, with Airflow. Uh, then we started on uh, version 2.2. So basically two solutions were, were available then. And it was external task sensor and trigger Dagan operator. And uh, <coughs> external task sensor was not considered from the beginning due to lack of uh, transparent uh, dependencies. This is why the trigger the ground operator seems to be an obvious solution for us, but it has one disadvantage. It couldn't resume a specific diagram. And on this slide, you can see what we were aiming for. Uh, each block was supposed to represent a separate DAC, uh, meaning we had to start them off in some way. And the result is that we wanted to have one main DAC creating network of dependencies for, for, uh, between other DACs. And uh, as an uh, additional advantage, we need to um, schedule only this one DAC 
instead of all of them separately, and we are able to manage all the failures from the one place. To address the specific requirements of our local environment, we created a, num a number of plugins for Airflow, uh, and uh, they will be covered in the next slides. They are the resume dagger and operator, which is a functionality that uh, enables us to resume the execution of a DAG with a fail task inside instead of restarting it from the level of the, let's say, parent DAG or main DAG. Uh, we created a task search option in the Airflow toolbar. Uh, we upgraded the daytime sensor functionality in order to uh, allow the proper handling of static time predecessors in case of a severe delay of the parent process start. Finally, we created a sensor script that would check Airflow, uh, the Airflow database itself uh, to see if there are any failed tasks inside, therefore forcing a crash at the level of the mainframe scheduler to address the incident management functionality that we will go deeper into later. <clears throat> okay, let's start from the resume diagram operator. And uh, as we showed you before, our aim was to achieve one main DAG with network of dependencies all, uh, between other smaller DAGs. And the first question came up to, uh, to us is, how can we resume the specific diagram? Because the triggering uh, a diagram is not pretty easy, but how can we uh, resume its execution? And uh, on the left side, you can see um, the DAG called Sample 5. It has uh, 100 tasks, 19 succeeding and, and failing. And on the other screenshot, you can see the example of dependencies between uh, between other DAGs. So the case is pretty simple. The uh, DAG called Sample 5 is failed, blocking execution of Sample 4. And uh, if we if we will use a trigger DAG operator to to, uh, to handle this, we basically have two ways to do this. First one, we can go to the uh, trigger diagram, then um, clear the failed task one by one, wait till they finish, then come back to the main DAG, and mark this task as success, um, and thanks to this, uh, the sample four will start. So this is a bit messy, replace, require, uh, require a lot of manual work. Um, the second approach is to set the trigger diagram operator in the such way that calling the clear event on it, will restart the whole DAG. But let's assume the sample five lasts five hours, and the last 10 tasks is respons responsible only for, let's say, last 20 minutes of the total time of execution. So basically, restarting the whole DAG is a huge waste of time. We couldn't afford for that. So obviously, none of those solutions fit to our concept. Therefore, we decided to, uh, to extend the trigger DAG and operator. And the last screenshot shows really similar uh, approach. I mean, we have the same uh, dependencies between DAGs. The sample five is uh, uh, also failed, but in such case, if we call clear event on this operator, it will restart only the failed task inside the sample five. <coughs> uh, another problem, caused in part by the fact that the, the main DAG, the, uh, our main process, is triggered by the mainframe scheduling, scheduling not uh, Airflow itself, is the possible delay of the process start. So <coughs> uh, by default, the main process, the main DAG, uh, is triggered after, after 9 p.m. So uh, all the static time dependencies after midnight should be shifted by one day. For example, if the uh, process starts at 9 p.m., then the part of the process responsible for new York tasks should be triggered no earlier than 1 a.m. of the next day. So uh, process starts at 28th of June, so the New York uh, uh, task should be triggered not before that 29th of June at 1 uh, a.m. However, if the process will be significantly delayed and the process st will start after midnight, so it already will be uh, 29th of June, the native daytime sensor will set the static time dependencies uh, one day ahead. So instead of 29th of June, there will be uh, 30th of June. And to compensate for this, we decided to um, extend the uh, daytime sensor. <coughs> and we uh, introduced the offset duration parameter. And this offset duration um, is a period that introduces a margin of error. If it, if it is set to six hours, as it's shown on the slide, uh, it simply means that um, it allows to the main process to start within the declared time window of the next day without affecting the static time dependence. <coughs> uh, 
the next, the next plugin is the task search through DAX, and we needed a way to quickly find the task in Airflow. And this is why we created um, uh, <coughs> Airflow search window in the Airflow toolbar. Um, of course, we are aware of the browse uh, task instances feature in Airflow, however, we needed something quicker without all the filtering stuff and which will work not only on task instances but also on tasks themselves. And this is our uh, final approach, our hy hybrid approach. Um, I have mentioned several times that Airflow um, has been combined with the mainframe scheduling uh, in our organization. And this was introduced to allow dependencies between uh, um, other systems. And some of the stuff has to be delivered before the main process starts, so those, of course, are upstream dependencies, while the end of the process should allow downstream dependencies to be processed. Um, additionally, we had to fit into an existing uh, incident management resulting from the company policy. And <coughs> to deal with this, we decided that our main process in Airflow, this, this main DAG, will be triggered by the mainframe scheduling. So this is the tile called main process in Airflow. Um, however, the nature of Airflow as a service-based application is that triggering DAG from the command line uh, will result an instant exit zero exit code being returned when the DAG has been triggered, and this is expected because this is how microservices works. Uh, so we needed a process that would monitor this, uh, this execution of the, uh, of the main process. And this is why we created sensor script. And uh, sensor is a basic Python script which checks directly on Airflow database uh, if the main process uh, finished successfully. If no, so it's running, it's failed, or it's uh, queued, then it checks if any of tasks belonging to this process or its subprocessors, because the main process triggers different bugs. So it checks if any of those tasks uh, is, stat is in status failed. If yes, then it failed um, separate scheduling job and then creating an incident, then it works as long as the main process in Airflow. Uh, when this main process finished successfully, sensor also finished it work successfully, allowing downstream dependencies to be processed. Reviewing what we gained by moving to Airflow uh, as a summary of the session, uh, we increased our own testing capacity. Uh, uh, the migration to Airflow enabled us to build a CI process based on Jenkins. Uh, and we could run as many uh, runs of our main uh, report generation process as we liked across many environments. There was no upper limit. Um, we uh, had a proper versioning, which uh, aside from all the obvious uh, benefits, uh, for example, uh, enabling a quick rollback of a faulty change, uh, allowed us to uh, define branching strategies for parallel projects. Uh, therefore, our scalability was massively increased, uh, and the output that we could produce as an application team uh, that was in charge of, uh, for example, s scheduling new reports to be generated was dramatically increased. Our task latency was reduced thanks to moving away from the mainframe scheduler, and uh, Airflow turns out has a uh, lower latency, and uh, we gained some time during the overall execution uh, of tasks. Uh, we gained much needed dependency visualization thanks to moving to Airflow. Uh, the migration, furthermore, forced us to redesign our own scheduling from scratch in order to make it, uh, to, to make the migration into Airflow, uh, let's say, make sense in order for us to benefit from it in terms of uh, understanding our scheduled dependencies. Uh, we grouped our tasks into blocks of similar jobs, which were then the source for the DAGs that were triggered as part of the main DAG execution. So. Uh, the migration as a side effect, uh, I mean, as a side effect of the migration, we redesigned our scheduling and greatly benefited from it, from that. Um, the effort required to analyze the existing dependencies was uh, greatly reduced. And finally, this migration uh, serves as a proof of concept for implementing Airflow in Uni Unicredit, uh, and in, in my opinion, at any other larger organization that uh, was a still using mainframe uh, and uh, related scheduling solutions for triggering their batch tasks. Uh, and with that in mind, we are open and keen to discuss and learn best practices for airflow usage at scale. With that, uh, our presentation is concluded. So if there are any questions, we will take them now. Thank you.
Uh, hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, since uh, Unit Credit is a bank, right? Uh, I wonder, uh, do you hit any, uh, say, regulatory or compliance or security requirements related to Alpha? Uh, yes, definitely we have. And basically, when we deployed version 2.2, uh, to be honest, we got audit points due to exactly security reasons. And those audit points uh, required cookies uh, and sessions uh, stuff uh, in Airflow. However, the upgrade to 2.6 solved this issue. Yeah, I have a question regarding the resume DAG operator that you described. Uh, have you um, considered using just task retries, uh, automatic task retries? And uh, if yes, what uh, led you to use a resume operator instead? Mm. Basically, using task retries isn't the case uh, in this scenario because uh, the resume background operator triggers uh, different DAGs, right? So if we retry the triggering DAG, we start from the beginning, and we really needed, uh, we really wanted to avoid that. Uh, this is why we decided to extend trigger background operator. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, what I meant is like the. So what I understand, you have one DAG that triggers other DAGs, and in those other DAGs, you might have a task that fell in the middle, but like you could retry, if you set up task retries within this sub DAG, then the, you wouldn't have to retreat to take care of it, like it would automatically retry the task that failed in the sub DAG, not the, not the task triggering the DAG, but the task that failed itself. Okay, I see, but in our case, basically restart the tasks, mostly not solve the case. So we need a manual intervention, intervention in such case. Awesome, thank you. So, so you said you would like to encourage the further um, um, adoption of, of Airflow within Unicredit Credit Bank. So, so how many users do you have right now and how many potential users there are? In terms of strictly Airflow or? On term, uh, I mean, Airflow, I would say, is still at a very early stage in terms of the whole organization. So right now, I think uh, it's limited mostly to the Warsaw application team, uh, the, my team that does the um, supports reporting out of uh, our uh, application. That's like 15 people, and then we have another 20 people involved in administration and operational maintenance uh, who are supporting Airflow from the admin side. Um, so I guess it's, it's, it's uh, 20, 25, 35 people right now. Uh, but in the end, I mean, I guess if, if the users will be basically the application teams of all the individual systems and applications, then probably that number will grow. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, at least hundreds, for sure, at least hundreds. I mean, the IT ecosystem of Unicredit is quite massive. So if we're talking from that perspective, uh, I think it has, uh, definitely has the potential to grow significantly. Right now we're only, I would say, in the local perspective. Um, do you run into any problems with like multi-tenancy and permissioning? So for example, do you have people who um, should be able to access some of the DAX and not others? Um, basically we before that, and this is our next step to uh, spread airflow at whole organization. So basically those issues are, we are before them. But I guess worth mentioning as well that uh, we do have, I mean, we're, we are using leveraging on the user roles, so only specific users in our airflow are able to uh, perform actions that have effect on uh, airflow behavior. And most users are read only. So this is, for now, our way of managing access. Big round of applause for the Unicredit team. Thank you so much.